Thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yeah? Okay. So I was supposed to give a sign when you, okay. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, my name is Michael Bush. I, um, I work and live in San Francisco for Twitter. Um, and uh, I'm the tech lead of the search infrastructure team at Twitter. And uh, before I start the, the technical part of the talk, just a couple of slides about what numbers we have to deal with. So we get, this number is already outdated actually, um, but we get 340 million tweets per day. I think it's closer to 400 now. Um, we have every day uh, 2.3 billion queries, so that makes us, I think, in terms of number of queries per day, the second biggest search engine after Google. And um, we have an indexing latency of less than 10 seconds. It means it doesn't take more than 10 seconds between you tweeted something and it's searchable. Um, and our average query response time for all these 2.3 billion queries is like 50 milliseconds. Um, And uh, in Twitter, all projects have bird names. So the real-time engine is called Early Bird. Um, so if I, if I mention Early Bird, it's, uh, it's about this modified Lucene index. So the agenda for today is I'm going to give you a very brief introduction, a little bit about the history of Twitter search. And then I'm going to talk about, also pretty briefly, about the general uh, search ar architecture and the different components we have. And I really want to dive into our inverted index and specifically the changes we made to Lucene to support, um, to support the real-timeness and the, the concurrency um, and, and the, the immense load that I just talked about. And then, um, if you have time at the end, I um, will talk a little bit about the next things we are doing. Um, um, the, we are extending the data structures that we support even more parts of the Lucene spec. And I can share some of the new stuff we are doing here. Um, and by the way, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions because it's kind of um, the talk built on top of each other. So if you have a question about the early part, then I'm happy to answer it, um, not at the end, because then you may miss other stuff. OK, so just a very brief introduction to um, Twitter search. Twitter bought, I think in 2009, uh, 2008, a small company that was called Semise. And there was a little start with like 10 people or so. And um, that was the first generation of, re of real-time search at Twitter. And it was actually surprisingly built on MySQL, which is not you know, normally the technology you would choose for this. But it worked surprisingly well until like 2010. And then the system was starting to fall apart. So we had to, re uh, we had to change the whole thing. So we, we started from scratch with inverted index based on Lucene. Um, we made a lot of improvements to Lucene or changes that are required for real-time search. And um, yeah, we all, one of the reasons, of course, we wanted to have something that's more modern and it's based on open source. So that was the other reason why we picked Lucene. Cool. OK, so our search architecture. So we have a few different components. The very first um, thing that happens when tweets come into the, to the system they go through various pipelines, and then they arrive at the search ingester. The ingester is a component that kind of pre-processes tweets and tokenizes them. And does it sound weird, actually, or does it sound weird to me only? No? OK. Um, the ingester pre-processes tweets, and it does stuff like URL expansion. So if you, for example, have bit.ly links, then we fetch the redirects of those links, and we tokenize uh, and normalize words and all that kind of stuff. And then. And there's still actually a little bit MySQL in our system, but currently we only use it to distribute data in our, in our uh, data center. Um, and we are working on actually removing MySQL altogether from the search architecture, but for now we still have it. So what happens is in Jester, when it, after it pre-processes the tweets, it serializes it into Thrift format. Don't know if you know Thrift, it's a data seri serialization format similar to protobufs. Um, and write the thrift object into MySQL master table. And then we have a bunch of machines that replicate from it. So that's how we get the data onto the different machines. Um, and then the Lucene indexes, the early bird indexes, run on those machines and, and tail their local MySQL slave database and index those preprocessed tweets in memory. So the early bird indexes are all in memory. All, all Lucene indexes I'm talking about today is, is, is all memory, all in memory. Um, we have another component called the Blender. The Blender is a thrift aggregation service. So the Blender is a component that um, receives search requests from the front end or from the component that renders the API. 
and uh, fans out those thrift requests to the different early bird machines. I'm going to show you in a second that we have a hash partition layout. So Blender takes care of sending um, the query to a covering set of early bird indexes and then receives from all those um, indexes the responses, merges them together, and returns them to the caller. Um, the Blender does more than just that. Uh, the Blender is kind of a service that can talk to a lot of different services, like early bird is just one. For example, it could also talk to our name search engine, which is a different index, or it could talk to, um, I don't know, our crawler to, you know, figure out some rendering information about URLs. So the Blender t can talk to a lot of different services and can then, as the name says, blend those results together and, and return that to the UI, for example. Um, our cluster, la cluster layout is as follows. So we have... Um, in one direction, we have replicas. So each early bird index is replicated just for um, scaling QPS, queries per second, but also, of course, for redundancy if we lose some machines. Um, then we have a pretty standard hash partition layout, which means we have it's, it's hash partitioned by, by document ID. So we have, um, I don't know, 20 or something hash partitions, and then we just mod the tweet ID by n, which is trendy or something like that, and index it in, the, in that hash partition. And then we have, in the other direction, time slices. So each early bird index, or each early bird time slice, contains up to 60 million tweets. Um, after, we, after it's full, after 60 million was reached, we start a new time slice. And as you probably know, and probably have complained about, Twitter doesn't currently index all tweets, or it doesn't keep all tweets in history in the search index, so you, you can only search back a certain amount of time. So the way we do that is um, once we start writing a new time slice on the top, we delete the latest one in the, in the bottom. That's how we have this rolling time slices in the system. And we can then live with a constant amount of RAM. And there is always one time slice that's writable. So that's, where we, that's a currently active one where we append data to. And that's, a, that's, in terms of real-time search, the most interesting one, because there we really have to solve that problem. How do we concurrently append data and read data at the same time with a slow latency of 10 seconds? Um, the other ones in the blue box here, those time slices are complete. And um, I'm not going to cover today what we do with complete segments. Um, we, we do a lot of compression. So actually, the, like a complete segment, after it went through some pro um, optimization steps, is only like 40% of the original size. So, um, but that's a different talk. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about the yellow box. Cool. So, to get started, I want to talk quickly about what an inverted index is. I'm sure a lot of people know it, but just for those who don't, I, I want to mention it quickly. And that's how Lucene works and pretty much any search engine in the world. Um, so, let's say we have these six documents here in this table. And um, it would be pretty slow if you want to search for a word in these documents to just like scan all those three, uh, six documents to find the right one. So um, and then in, in, in an index like we've seen, we invert these documents. And what it means is we find all unique words in those documents and put them into a table. So these are, these are all the unique words that you can find in here. And then um, that's a dictionary. And then on the, on the right side of this dictionary, we have linked lists that that are called posting lists, and these posting lists basically contain the uh, IDs of the documents in which that particular word occurred. So, for example, the word keeper here occurs in documents you know, 1, 4, and 5. So now here we um, have the word keeper and those three numbers. So now it's pretty easy to, if the query is keeper, it's pretty easy to just find it in, 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 in this table. For example, this could be implemented as a hash table. So it's really an O of one look up to find keeper, and then it's, you just have to, to decode those three numbers, and you have your search results. Um, and now you can probably imagine that the majority of storage that you need in the next is used for these posting lists here, because they get, can, get really, can get really long, and you also get a lot of terms. So I think in, I think in, this, in a segment with like, 8 million tweets, we have like you know, 10 million unique terms, so a little bit more than one unique ter uh, um, term per tweet on average. So those, those dictionaries get pretty, pretty long in both directions. So, um, 
And, and let's talk about how to encode these, po these doc IDs efficiently. So for example, if you um, have these doc IDs up here, then um, what Lucene does actually, and we do it differently, but Lucene does it the following way. Um, we don't write the doc IDs itself, but we, we encode deltas. So for example, if you have document 100,000 and then 100,090, we actually don't store the 100,090 again. We store the difference between these two numbers, which is just 90. Um, which is a smaller number, and the smaller number we can compress better by using techniques, for example, like vint compression. Um, a vint is a variable length integer that can um, that requires anywhere between one and five bytes. And the way that works is that the first bit in a in a vint of each byte indicates if the following byte is part of the same value. So, for example, um, in this in this case here, uh, the first bit is, a, is set, is set to 1, and when we decode it, we, we know, okay, I still need to read the next byte um, because it's part of the same value. And that's how, for very short values that, um, that are sh uh, smaller than 128, we only need one byte to encode them. So that's how Lucene makes those posting lists um, smaller and more efficient. Um, so the One thing we should, we to, we should realize about this encoding is that we can only read it in one direction. We can only read it from left to right, because um, in order to, uh, to calculate what posting this actually is, here that it's 9,000, you, you have to keep summing them up, right? So you can only read them from left to right. But if you think about a use case like Twitter, where by default we rank search results from new to old, what we really actually want to do is we want to, we want to read the posting list backwards, because if we start with the freshest documents and read backwards, and uh, we can stop after we found, for example, 10 documents. If we want to show 10 on the search result page, then after we found 10 results, we can early terminate and stop. If you would read from left to right, you would have to read through the entire index to, um, to find the search results. So that's less efficient. So what, one thing we wanted to really do is we want to, wanted to be able to design our index, we can read it in the opposite direction. Um, the other thing is, and I'm going to talk later in the talk about how we deal with concurrency, but the other um, goal here was that we are able to write postings atomically in Java, which um, by that I mean we wanted to use a data type that you can write in a single atomic operation. Um, for example, you can write an integer in Java atomically, you can actually, by the, by the Java spec, you cannot write a long atomically. Java spec says 64 bit values are not written atomically, even though I think. Um, it works on 64-bit machines, <laughs> but um, the spec doesn't promise it. Um, but if you think about the VNT encoding, where you need maybe one or three bytes, like for example, if you need three bytes, there's no data type in Java that has three bytes, right? So you wouldn't be able to write this value atomically. That's the other downside of this um, encoding. So in our index, the encoding is extremely simple. Every posting is mapped to an integer with 32-bit. Um, and we use upper 24 bits for the doc ID itself. That's why the maximum value we can store is 16.7 million. And as I said earlier, our maximum time slice size is 16 million tweets. Um, that's where the number comes from, because we use 24 bits. Um, we also store the position of a, of a word within the tweet, within the text. Um, but as you know, tweets cannot be longer than 140 characters. So 255 is enough to encode the position within the tweet. Um, and you need to store positions if you do stuff like phrase queries, you know, two words in, in quotes. If you want to find out they're next to each other, you need to encode the positions too. That's why we need to store this. Um, so it's a really like, simple encoding. Um, at the end of the talk, I'm going to show you how we are extending this encoding, that we can also store actually more than 255 text positions. We, have, we are working currently on that. Um, but this is, um, this is currently in production in, in, at Twitter. And now we also don't store these uh, doc IDs as deltas anymore, which means we can read them in both directions. And then we can do the early termination that I talked about. So we, we can start at the end, read from uh, right to left, and for example, if three results were requested in this request, then um, after we found three, we can stop and finish this, the search early and very efficient. Is there any questions so far? I don't know where it is. Oh, there it is. 
I could also try to repeat the question if I can hear it from here. Um, so I was wondering, how do you enforce the, or how do you make sure that the doc, doc IDs that come into early bird are uh, incremental and not just randomly ordered? Oh, the, so these are not tweet IDs. Mm -hmm. The doc IDs, these are internal IDs. So each segment starts from zero. So basically, V controls the ordering. So we get a tweet and we assign it an internal ID. And then in a different data structure, we have a mapping from the unique IDs, which are the tweet IDs that are also public um, IDs. And we map them to the internal IDs, which are between 0 and 16 million. OK. And by that, you, you make sure that you, always, you, you can always store the deltas. That, uh, it, it never happens that you would have a, a negative value no. for some reason. No. no, no. OK. But also, we don't store the deltas, so that's why it won't be negative values anyway. But. Cool. OK, so a little summary about this. Yeah, ints can be written atomically, so we accomplished that goal. We can do the backwards traversal. Every posting is a possible entry point, so there are no postings depend on an adjacent posting, so we can start anywhere in the posting list to read it. Um, skipping can be done without additional data structures, because postings are fi a fixed size. They're always four bytes. Uh, 32 bits, so we can always we could even do binary search, even though that's not very cache efficient. But we could do that. Um, we need a bit more memory than Lucene currently for this. I think it's 20 percent, maybe more, 30 percent more, but um, only for the live segments. So for the optimized segments, we are actually very memory efficient. Um, as I said, they get they get down to less than half the size, and yeah, the max segment size is uh, 60 million tweets. So now, um, now that you know what an inverted index is, and now I'm going to talk about how the different, uh, how we manage memory and how we actually store that stuff. So we have those two big components. One is a dictionary, one is a posting storage. I'm going to start with a dictionary. So, um, and you notice here that um, so a dictionary has all the terms, and then it has some metadata. So for example, here is this is called the document frequency. It's basically just a number of documents in which a um, term occurs in, the, in, in your 16 million segment. So there's some metadata per term that you have to store. Um, and the way it works is we have a hash table that, let's see, yeah. So we have a hash table, and when we see the first term, we assign a term ID to that first term. So for example, the first term is cat, we assign the ID 0, and then it hashes somewhere into this uh, hash table, which is just, just an integer array. And in this hash table, we just write the term ID, which is zero. And then at the same time, this um, term ID is actually an index into these parallel arrays here, which store the, the metadata about the term. Like, for example, the, term the document frequency here, or some po pointers that we need. For example, a pointer to where its posting list is going to start, and actually also pointer to where the text itself is kept, because we also have to remember the, the actual text of that term for hash collisions. Um, so there's another like storage, which is like like a string buffer in Java. It's it's not a string buffer, but it's similarly, so it grows. And it's based on UTF-8 bytes, so it's a kind of a byte array um, that can grow. And there we also store the text. So if if we get the next term, um, you know they hash somewhere here, but then in the parallel arrays we can keep them very s small and compact. We don't have to oversize them. The the hash table usually you have like a 50% load factor, so the hash table is at least twice as big as it needs to be, so you waste some storage here, but you don't waste much here because um, the indexes are uh, dense. And this is actually a change we made to Lucene specifically for um, improving garbage collection. Before, we used to have objects for each term. So if you had, in our example, 10 million unique terms in the segment, you would have end up with 10 million objects, you know, term objects that had members for each of these columns here. Um, so we had a lot of objects. So now, now we actually have a fixed size of objects, um, which is independent of the number of unique terms. So garbage collection uh, performance increased significantly. So the whole indexing performance increased by like between 80 and 400 percent, depending on how much how big your heap is. Yeah. I talked about this. Cool. So, so we now know how this part looks. So now, how how do we how do we store the posting list itself? And here are some objectives for the storage um, 
component. So we want to be able to store a lot of linked lists. And, and the, the key thing here is we don't know when we start a list, we don't know how long it's going to be. So the, the difficulty here is we don't know how much memory to allocate because we don't know if it's like a new hashtag that's going to become super popular and it's going to be a trending topic today and then we need maybe, you know, it's going to be three million times in three million tweets or so, or it could just be a unique term that we're never going to see again. So obviously we can't at that point know that and um, therefore we don't know yet how much storage to allocate, how much RAM. Also again, we need to, um, garbage collection is very important, so we need to keep the number of objects low. So that's another um, objective here. Um, and then the things I said earlier, we have to be able to read backwards. Um, and here's the thing also about concurrency. We want to be able to um, read and write from the storage without locking because it would just be too expensive to, to, to do this, to design this in a, uh, with locks. Okay, so this is how the data structure works. Um, we start with having four pools, and the pool is basically, just think of a pool as a large integer array that can grow. So it can, it can grow by appending an integer block to it. Um, so for example, here we have uh, four you know, 32K integer arrays, and we can allocate more in this direction, and then each pool, each level, can grow independently. So we can make, you know, this one here much longer than ones on the bottom. And for now you can forget that there are like multiple integer arrays underneath such a pool. For, we can for simplicity now just think of these, of these four pools as never ending integer arrays that we can grow dynamically. So on each pool we have a slice allocator and the slice allocator um, and the slice sizes are fixed for each pool. So on the lowest level we have a slice size of two. Um, um, on, the, on the next level, we have slices 16, 128, and uh, 2048. And um, on each pool, we can allocate many slices, but they're always the same size. So here, the slice is always two, for example. So now when we see if a term for the very first time, because we don't know yet how often we're going to see it, we start allocating a slice on the lowest pool here. And since the size is two, we, are, we can then you know, store its first occurrence in there, and we will have room for a second occurrence if it occurs again. If you see a term more than two times, then we go up a level and allocate a slice here. And then we have room for 16 more, and 128 more, and 2048 more. So if we even see it more often than like, whatever the sum of these four numbers is, like 2200 or something like that, um, we stay on the, on the highest level and just append another slice on this level to the same list. So, so all these green slices are part of the same linked list. So now how do we make sure... Uh, yeah, so now we have to make sure that we can also get from one to the other slice that are on the same list. So we have to link the slices together. And here's just one reminder of how the posting list format looks. It was a 32-bit, you know, 24-bit um, for Docker, 8-bit for text position, so that fits in the integers. We wanted to fit the pointers to and posting also in an integer, and I'm going to show in a second why that's beneficial. So, that, so that's why we actually also pack a pointer into an integer, so into 32 bits. The first upper two bits here are for the pool index, and remember we have four pools, so two bits are enough to encode on which pool we are. Depending on which pool we are, we also know the size of a slice. So for example, if we are on the highest pool, then um, we know that the size of a slice is um, 2 to the power 11. So we need 11 bits in this case to address a certain offset within that slice. And so um, depending on which pool we, we use that many bits for the slice offset, and then whatever we have left. So for example, on the highest level, you know, we would need two bits for the pool index, 11 bits here, so 13 bits. So we have 19 left. So then we would have 19 bits to address a slice within a pool. Right? So the three things are we have to get to a pool, we have to get to a slice, and then we have to get to an offset within a slice. And we can accomplish all the three things with those three different uh, components here. So now the cool thing is we can actually store a pointer also in an integer itself, and that's how we link it together. Because now we can use the very first entry in such a slice as a backwards pointer. So here this is not going to be a posting the first slot in this integer array or in this slice. It's actually a pointer backwards to the previous posting. 
And then in these parallel rays, where I earlier showed that we also need a pointer to the last posting in this um, data structure, uh, in this list, um, we also store the same encoding. We also have like a, a column here that's an integer array. So there we store also pointer to the very last po posting. And this one we always update as we append postings to this, to this list. So um, yeah, so this is basically then how search at Twitter works. So if you enter, if you enter, if you search for hashtag or whatever, we look it up in the dictionary by hashing, get the term ID, follow the term ID, um, look up the pointer to the posting list in the parallel array, follow that pointer, um, and then start reading the posting list backwards, 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 until we find a, a, another pointer, go to the previous slice, and then follow through here until we either reach the end, or we maybe early terminated somewhere in the middle, because we already satisfied the query and found enough search results. Uh, any questions so far? Yeah, so the question is how do you do early termination with Boolean queries? Um, well, I mean, you just, I mean, yeah, of course you execute an end, end operation or an operation, and then uh, once you found enough results that satisfied that end, then you stop in each list, right? I mean, you don't, you don't do the early termination on the list level, you do the early termination on the, on the end operator level, basically. Test. Ah, I was just curious how you came up with slice sizes. Was it an empirical thing or? Yeah, that was like a, I mean, Lucene does something a little similar. Um, so some, I don't know, it was kind of a gut feeling, but actually some, <laughs> some people wrote a paper about this now and analyzed this, and this gets actually very close to the optimum, this, this sizing. I think they came up in the paper with a few but and if, if you used eight levels instead, and then I can't remember the slice sizes, then it would be slightly better. But this is cl very close to the, op to the optimum, actually. But in the very beginning, we did, it was just more like trying out. <laughs> um, but I mean, you can, you, I mean you, can, you can analyze it. You know, usually your terms are distributed by a Ziffian distribution, and then you could actually, like, this math, just calculate what the most efficient encoding would be. So that's what I did in the paper. So now I want to talk about concurrency, which is particularly interesting in this, um, in this index. So first, first a few definitions. So pessimistic locking is what's commonly used when you synchronize keywords. So basically you protect a certain area of code from being, being accessed from more than one thread at the same time. That's what kind of everybody knows, just for if you write synchronized in front of a method or, or a block. Optimistic locking is um, usually accomplished differently by, for example, in Java, you often use for that atomic integers. Um, and uh, what, what you do is um, you, you try to perform an operation, and you don't care if some other thread is doing something there too in this area, uh, but you can detect if the operation was successful or not, and if it was not, then you actually retry it. Um, and it's, it's good to use pessimistic locking if um, conflicts are to be expected. Um, because then it may just make more sense to just prevent the conflicts. But if conflicts are just not are just going to be rare, I mean, you still have to make sure if there's a rare conflict, you have to be able to, I mean, your program has to be correct. But if they are not the norm, then you should not use pessimistic locking, basically, because then the locking is just more expensive than your actual business logic. And I gave the same talk, a uh, similar talk at Stanford two weeks ago, and the next student asked me, why is it called optimistic locking if you don't lock? And I actually don't have a good answer for that, but I think it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's, it's often called locking. I think um, one answer that I gave was, um, often you call this a spin lock. Ten minutes only? Really? No. Often you call this a spin lock. Um, you have like an endless loop that retries um, certain operations until it succeeded. So I have to hurry up a little bit here. So um, a lock-free algorithm is an algorithm that um, where there's guaranteed progress in your system, so where, um, where always a threat makes, uh, makes progress. And a wait-free algorithm is an algorithm where every threat actually at any time makes progress. So no threat is actually waiting for the other one. 
So we wanted our engine to be weight-free. Um, and every weight-free algorithm is log-free too, of course. So we wanted to be weight-free and as efficient as possible. Um, and what we did was we actually, and that change went pretty recently into Lucene, it's going to be released as part of Lucene 4. Uh, the, we, re, we changed the whole way the, the threading model in Lucene's index writer works. So now what we actually do is we have one writer thread um, and multiple reader threads. And that um, simplifies the problem a lot because you don't have to worry about two writers messing up the same data structure. Um, you just, I mean, just it's still a hard problem, but you just have to make sure now that readers always see a consistent view of your index, but you don't have to worry about corrupting data structures. Um, and <coughs> and uh, in Java, it's actually not guaranteed um, that a thread will see changes another thread makes until uh, unless you take specifically care of it. And that's, uh, at least when I started working on this, wasn't like, completely clear to me. I, knew how syn I thought I knew how synchronization works, and I thought I knew everything about Java's concurrency, but I actually didn't really know about self-publication, or hadn't thought much about it. I'm going to um, show an example of what this really means, all, all this stuff. But um, I would also highly recommend, if you work in Java, I mean, this is an awesome book here, the uh, Java Concurrency in Practice. I think it's the best Java book out there. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take an example of that book and explain very briefly the Java memory model in, in a few rules. So there's something I call the program order rule, and that's the rule everybody knows. Maybe not with the name, but everybody knows it. Um, it basically just says the program gets executed in the order you write it. So line one gets executed before line two, if you just look at one thread itself. Um, and I bet people probably also know the volatile variables in Java. Um, and then there's another rule that says um, a, a write to volatile field happens before every subsequent read of that same field. So that's, that's a little weird, that rule, because it kind of has two concepts of time in the same, in the same uh, sentence, happens before and subsequent. So what it basically means is that if in absolute time, like in total time on clock cycles, you know, now you write something to field, and then uh, 10 clock cycles later, a different thread reads from the same field, it's guaranteed to see the update. And that specific, specific point is not true for non-volatile fields. And then you have transitivity. So if A happens before B and B happens before C, then A happens before C. So I have an example for this. Um, so let's say we have two threads, one and two, and we have a non-volatile, just a primitive, normal integer x in the Java program. And then thread one assigns the value five to x. So because this uh, integer is not uh, volatile, and we have, you know, nowadays, we have CPUs with multiple cores and multiple layers of cache, so the CPU is just going to write it, for example, into its L1 cache, and there's nothing that forces it to actually write it through to shared memory, to you know, L3 or, or RAM. So, it's, so now if thread 2 has a loop, for example, it loops until x becomes 5, this program may never terminate, actually, because there's nothing, as I, as I said, there's nothing that forces 5 to be written to the RAM. However, if you write this program a little differently, so let's say we use another field B, also integer, but that is declared as volatile, and then thread 1 first um, assigns 5 to X, and then 1 to B, and then thread two reads B and executes the same loop as before. So now let's, let's take our rules that we learned earlier from the memory model and see um, what happens. So if we take the program order rule, if we just look at thread one, x equals five is, a, is executed before B equals one. And if we just look at thread two, it's also ordered in the order it's written, executed in the order it's written. Um, now let's take the volatile rule. So we, B is volatile. So um, the write happens before the read. And now if we take transitivity, that means actually that now indeed x equals 5 happens before the loop, and the loop will terminate. And um, therefore, one can actually use, since Java, this, this all is, by the way, only true after Java 5. Before Java 5, that was different. Um, but therefore, we can actually use a volatile field as a memory barrier, which means we can actually use that to flush stuff from, from, from CPU local caches into shared memory. Um, we can force such, such a flush. And I see faces that don't express much trust. So I have a little program here that tries to prove what I just said. Um, 
So we have, a, we have a really simple program here. It's very similar to what I had on the slide. Um, and uh, so we have two fields here. We have a counter and a max, which are non-volatile. And we have a writer thread here. And the writer, what it just does is it um, increments the counter variable until it reaches 1,000. So you know, very straightforward. And at the end, it sets this field memory barrier to, to 1. And the field memory barrier is, is a volatile field. So the reader. Um, yeah, it just actually is, this, is kind of this loop that I had on the slide. It just loops until um, counter reached max, which we would assume should happen pretty soon. Um, counting 2000 doesn't take very long, right? So, um, and then if, if it's done, if the reader is done, it prints out, okay, I'm done. Um, and the main method here just, uh, I, I notice this is commented out, so ignore this for now. Um, so the main method here, what it does is first, first it starts 10 reader threads and it says, okay, all threads are started, and then it starts a writer and waits until the program finishes. So let's start this program and see what happens. So we see it's printed out, all threads are started, but no thread, no reader thread actually said it's done yet. So, and I think, so here it's still running, you can see it's still running here, um, and then nothing is happening, so, I mean, we could wait a little bit, but I, I guess not much will happen anymore because it should have counted 2,000 by now, right? So let's stop it and uncomment this line here. Um, so now we just do dummy read of this memory barrier field. And look, Eclipse even claims this is unused and wants me to remove it. So Eclipse actually doesn't know about the side effect that I'm going to show. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just a dummy. I don't do anything with it, right? So the program didn't change very much, but if you run it now, then you see that all the threads are merely done and the program is terminated. So this kind of like kind of proves the um, the stuff I had here on the slide. So what's really interesting about this is now actually that we can use the same behavior for our real-time index um, and for the for for how we actually um, flush caches to RAM. So we have an index writer, and it, let's say it inverts 100 documents. It builds all these data structures that I talked about for 100 documents. And like none, none of all these integer arrays and all that stuff, anything is volatile. This is all like just primitive uh, um, integer arrays. And then, when, let's say when it's done with 100 documents, then we have one field that's called max doc. And uh, could you guys be a little bit more quiet there, maybe? Um, so we have one field that's uh, volatile, that's max doc. And after we wrote the 100 uh, documents, we assigned the value 100 to max doc. And then any time we open a new reader, and we actually, unlike Lucene, where in, opening index readers is a bit more expensive, in early bird, we actually, for every of those 2.3 billion queries, we open a fresh index reader. And the first thing that index reader does is it actually reads the max doc. And since that is a volatile read, now it's guaranteed that this index reader sees a consistent snapshot of all documents up to number 100. It may already see something newer because you cannot prevent the, the, your system to not flush stuff from cache to RAM, but it's guaranteed that it can see everything to up to 100. So now when we do our search algorithms, we um, make sure that, if we, that we only read up to document 100 because then we are sure we, can, we, are, we, we have a consistent view of, the, of that part of the index. And um, yeah, that's how it's really efficient because normally if you would make everything volatile all your integer arrays, I played around with it. I mean, you, volatile fields are like 3 to 10x slower because you don't use the, the faster cache, right? Um, so in, in this case, we delay this flush as much as possible and therefore get much better performance. Because flushing like everything at once from cache to RAM is more efficient than like flushing uh, like thousands of times like every single value that you, that you write. Yeah, and this here again is the happens before rule. Um, because of this um, max stock is volatile, we have the same transitive dependency here. So. Cool. Here's kind of like the, the not very formal proof that this is weight free. So we don't have a single exclusive lock in the system. Uh, the writer thread can always make progress. There's nothing that pre it preven prevents it from it. Um, we, have, we have kind of one place where we have some optimistic locking, and I didn't talk about this because it's kind of hard to explain that in a, in a short time. I would have to show a lot of corner cases. But it's kind of the pointer that points from the parallel array to the, last, to the most recent posting. Um, that guy, um, 
it's a little tricky to get right. So there we have retry logic. We have like, um, but the retry logic actually only has two possible cases. So you try, you try one value first, and you can detect if it was right or wrong. If it was wrong, then you know the alternative value is definitely the right one. So um, yeah, there's optimistic locking, if you will, but it has only like one alternative case. All right, I'm. I guess I'm out of time. I would, I would need five more minutes. If, I don't know if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. If you want, if you want, you can, <laughs> you can of course go to the next talk. But I can quickly talk about um, what's next. So what I talked about is currently in production, and um, yeah, it does the obvious disadvantage is that it does not support documents longer than 140 characters, which makes it not very useful for you know general Lucene. So. Um, what we want to do is we want to support the full Lucene spec, so we want to index positions bigger than 255, we want to be able to uh, index payloads, we want to have point-in-time document frequencies. Um, and actually, we, have, we implemented all this stuff, it's called complete actually this week, <laughs> but we haven't tried it out yet, so I can actually not even, not promise performance numbers yet, but we think it should be pretty good. And I will just quickly give you the general idea. So we, we are changing the encoding of, of the doc IDs very slightly, so now, we only use seven bits for the position, so we still use 24 bits for the docker D. We use now only seven bits for the position or the term frequency, and we use uh, one bit to indicate what we are storing in here. So what this means is if we find a position, if we are indexing a position that is smaller than 127, which means we can encode it into seven bits, then we set this bit to, um, to zero here, and we inline that position. And we only do that, as I said, if, uh, if three conditions I think are true. One is um, this document has only one occurrence of that word, which um, is very frequent for tweets, not very frequent if you're next book, maybe. Um, if the text position is smaller than 127, almost always the case for tweets. Um, and if it doesn't have a, have a payload, uh, which is also in our index currently true. So we, we think this will actually not make the index need more space at all for tweets right now. So we are still kind of uh, keeping all the benefits for, for tweets. But um, if one of those con conditions is not true, we will set this bit to one, and there will actually be a second data structure that I'm going to show in a second where we then store positions and payloads. The other thing we do is we introduce a skip list in, in and this is a slice on the highest pool level, so the, the slices that are two to the power of 11, 2048. We introduce skip lists, and I think the skip list size currently is 64 bytes, or maybe it's 128 bytes, I'm not entirely sure. So in, in regular intervals, we have a skip list entry, and that is good for two reasons. One is we can more efficiently skip, um, and the other reason is that we can use these skip entries and actually store pointers in the secondary data structure, which is the following one here. And that's a very similar data structure to Lucene. Lucene stores, standard Lucene indexing format stores positions and payloads in a second file. And we store it now in a second like byte array in memory. And that has positions and payloads encoded. The only difference to Lucene here is basically that we, are, we can actually encode it, we, we encode it in a way, it's um, a little complicated too, there's a few corner cases that I don't have on the slide. But the key idea also is that we can read it in both directions, because as I said, if you want to read the position, uh, sorry, the documents in the opposite direction, you also need to read the positions in the opposite direction. But now we can actually efficiently skip to any document here using the skip list, and then find. So, for example, if we want to skip to somewhere here in the middle, we find the previous skip entry, follow its pointer to the position, position file, and then we just uh, skip back a few um, positions so that we get to the to the one that corresponds to the actual doc ID that we wanted to find here. So you have a little bit overhead for seeking the right entry, but it's only like the very first time you open a posting. You open a posting list, um, and actually, how the how the how um, so logically this looks like this. But how we actually store it is we um, store the entire skip list in the beginning of the slice, and for cache efficiency, and then I have to stop now, and then we store the postings here. And I think that's actually the last. Slide. Oh, that's one more slide, but I can skip that one. Okay, that's it. <laughs>